Thanks, Sophia. Uh, so good morning, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So I hope that works because now I can't see Zoom anymore. Oh, I can still see Zoom. Can you give me a thumbs up, Sophia, if you can see my slides? I can see, yes. Perfect. Uh, then uh, let me get rid of these floating meeting controls. Okay. So a uh, quick introduction of myself. Uh, as Sophia said, I am professor of internet security. Um, I think for a little bit of context, I had prior roles in industry uh, and I spent uh, more than a decade working for the National Research and Education Network in the Netherlands called SurfNet. Uh, and I have more than two decades of experience with the domain name system. Um, and I'm very interested in DNSSEC operations research. This is one of the topics that um, that my research covers. Um, I am not a cryptographer, but I do use a lot of cryptography. So um, if you start throwing math at me, I will probably have this really blank look on my face. Um, but uh, I do know uh, quite a bit about applying crypto in different uh, applications. Um, now, if you hear barking while I'm giving this presentation, it's because of this young lady who is currently uh, in this position under my desk. So uh, uh, if the mailman delivers something, you may have a slight disruption during the presentation. So bear with me, please. Good. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to briefly give an overview of what I will be talking about today. Um, I will give you a quick primer on DNS and DNSSEC. So you, you know actually what we're talking about in the protocol and the role that crypto plays in it. Um, then I will spend quite a bit of time talking about the problematic history of uh, DNSSEC and transport. Uh, and when I say transport, I mean transport of DNS information over the internet. Um, I will, of course, be talking about how we solve these problems in the community. Um, I spend a little bit of time talking about what, what we called DNS Flag Day, which was last year. Uh, and then I'll zoom in on uh, post-quantum crypto and DNSSEC and, and basically talk about that. Uh, and we'll finish with time for uh, questions and answers. Um, and if you have questions in the meantime, I, I can actually see the, what's it called, Zulip. So um, if you ask your questions on the, on the Zulip thing, I, I will try to answer them during the presentation. So let's start with a quick primer, the domain name system. For those of you uh, uh, who are less familiar with uh, internet operations, uh, you use the domain name system every day. Uh, I hope you realize this. And the main reason for using the DNS is to translate human readable names to machine readable information. And the most common use is the mapping of names to IP addresses. And on the slide, you see a screenshot from my uh, terminal where I uh, give the command dig for example.org. And it tells me uh, in the answer section further down that the IP address for example.org is something starting with 93 dot and then something else. So that is actually something that we use the DNS for on a day-to-day -day basis. And without the DNS, there is no internet, right? So next to IP, I would argue that DNS is the most important infrastructure on the internet because it allows us to uh, use human-readable information rather than machine-readable information to access the internet. Um, DNS, as, as most of you will know, is organized as a hierarchical namespace. And uh, the reason I'm stressing this again is that DNSSEC also uses this hierarchy um, the, uh, uh, at, the, at the top, we have the, the root of the DNS, uh, and below that, we have the so-called top-level domains, uh, things like com, net, and l that you may be familiar with. And uh, if we go further down, we have second-level domains and third-level domains, and so on and so forth. In DNS, you can generally identify three roles. We have uh, clients, uh, which is you on your mobile phone or on your laptop or whatever. We have recursive caching name servers, which are colloquially known as DNS resolvers, and we have authoritative name servers. Um, in this talk, I won't be talking about clients at all, because even though the pipe dream in the IETF is that everybody will do endpoint DNSSEC validation someday, that is far from the case today, right? DNSSEC validation now happens on DNS resolvers, and clients simply rely on the fact that resolvers do this for you. Um, in an ideal world, your client would also be doing DNS accreditation. 
Right, let's start by focusing on problems with the DNS. The original protocol for the DNS dates back to the early 1980s. Uh, and that means there is no built-in security whatsoever because everybody knew everybody else on the internet. We're talking about an era when there were maybe a thousand computers on the internet. Um, in 1997, uh, uh, it was demonstrated for the first time that you can easily fool uh, DNS clients into accepting false information in the so-called cache poisoning attack. A guy called Eugene Kasparev uh, who didn't agree to uh, the, the, the DNS being centrally run and people somewhere in an office deciding which top level domains were allowed and which were not. He didn't agree with that and he decided to set up his own uh, company called Alternic. Uh, and when he didn't get what he wanted, uh, he uh, performed uh, the first cash poisoning attack to get his way. Um, that was recognized as an issue. Some patches were applied. It wasn't seen as a big a, a huge deal. But then in 2008, uh, uh, Dan Kaminsky came along and he published a variant of this attack that made it trivial to perform cache poisoning. Uh, I don't know if, if, if all of you know, unfortunately, Dan Kaminsky passed away um, uh, recently, um, but his uh, attack basically changed the DNS. And then in 2013, uh, uh, Amir Herzberg published another variant of, of cash poisoning, which, frag, uh, which uh, leverages fragmentation. And we'll come back to this later on because there is some interplay with the NSSEC here. The root cause of all of these problems is there are no mechanisms for authenticity and integrity in the original DNS protocol. While there is a, a simple query identifier in there, that mostly has the function of being able to map your query to your response, but it doesn't have a security function. And there simply isn't enough information in DNS packets to authenticate them. Right, so that meant we needed something else. Uh, and for this, we have DNSSEC. The goal of DNSSEC is to add authenticity and integrity to the DNS, um, but note that it does not add confidentiality. That was never uh, a goal, and we have other protocols to add confidentiality to the DNS. Um, it adds additional so-called resource records, and I'll show you an example of that in the, in the next couple of slides, uh, to the DNS, uh, uh, and we have one research rec record for uh, signatures, which we call RRSIG, and one for public keys, which we call DNS key. Um, in most cases, you will find that signing is typically done offline, so the entire DNS zone is signed in one go. But there are cases where this is done online, for example, in content delivery networks that use DNS for load balancing and, uh, uh, and use that for local content cache selection. And for example, uh, Bas and Sophia work for Cloudflare, they do online signing most of the time. So they're one of the exceptions. Um, in DNSSEC, there is a single route of trust, the DNS root zone, and we validate uh, signatures along this chain of trust. And I'll explain that in a separate slide later on. Okay, so let's look at uh, how DNSSEC changes the protocol. Um, this is a, a very, very simple DNS zone uh, for a domain uh, that I called uh, example.com. Uh, and what you see in here are all the different types of uh, uh, resource records that such a, a zone might, uh, might have. There is a, there's an A record for IP, uh, IPv4 addresses. There's a quad A record for IPv6 addresses. There are some NS records which tell you uh, the name servers for this particular domain and so on and so forth. Um, one takeaway from uh, this particular example is that you can see that there are sets of research records that are uh, coherent. So they are for the same name. So they're different mappings for the same name and they form a set. So in this example, on lines four and five, you see the NS records for uh, this particular zone and they together they form a, a single research record set. Why is that important? If we DNSSEC sign a zone, um, we sign resource record sets. We don't sign individual records. So uh, what you can see here, uh, I marked them in yellow, are the signatures that were added to sign this zone. Uh, and what you can see, for example, uh, on line seven is a signature that covers uh, the two records uh, that form a set on lines five and six. And of course, if there's only a single record, then the signature will cover that single record. Uh, something else that we need to add to the zone is the set of public keys that, we sh uh, uh, that belong to the private keys that were used to sign this zone because otherwise we cannot validate the signatures. 
Now, obviously, anybody can put their keys in a zone and then pretend that they have signed it. Of course, that doesn't work. We need some mechanism for this uh, uh, trust for trust to be invested in those keys. Uh, and in uh, uh, DNSSEC, we do this along a chain of trust all the way from the root of the DNS. Um, and this might be a lot to take in. I hope you can read this slide. Uh, on the left hand side, you see all the way at the top a trust anchor that is the uh, key signing key, the, the, the public key signing key of the root of the DNS. This is configured uh, on a DNS resolver. So this is the thing that you configure and you set it and it changes only very occasionally. So the last time it was rolled over was in 2018. Um, and they're currently planning another rollover, but that will be some time to come. Um, and that root uh, key then uh, signs the, the root zone and the root zone contains a, a so-called a DS delegation signer record is the little uh, gray icon for uh, the top level domain that your domain is in, in this case .nl. Uh, then .nl has this whole shebang again. It has uh, a public key um, uh, and a private key that are used to sign the key set, then a key that is used to sign the zone. And then there is another DS record for the domain that I'm actually interested in, in this case surfnet.nl. Um, which references the keys for that particular domain and so on and so forth. So if I want to, evalu uh, to evaluate the signature on uh, www.surfnet.nl, I can walk this chain of trust all the way back to the root. And it, this means that I only need to trust the root key in order to trust the signature for something way down in the DNS tree. Um, right. So this brings me, uh, uh, and by the way, if you have questions, just ask them. I can't see the Zoom chat. So if you ask questions there, Sophia will have to interrupt me. Uh, ask them in, in Zulip. So DNSSEC transport, um, the original DNS specification allows a maximum message size of 512 bytes. And that was way too small for DNSSEC because we need to um, uh, store keys and signatures in responses. And um, for that reason, the protocol extension to the DNS was designed. It's called eDNS0. Um, and uh, if, you, if you read DNSSEC literature, you'll encounter this, this uh, acronym a lot, eDNS0 is uh, the transport extension. And basically what it does is it, it leverages um, a sort of pseudo record that you can put in a DNS response where you can specify additional parameters. And I've highlighted Two of them here in red. Um, the first one is the, the DO bit, which is a little bit further down that says DNS okay. If that flag is set in a DNS query, uh, you're basically telling the, the DNS server that you're contacting that it's okay to send you uh, DNSSEC data. And the, uh, what is also covered in there is the requester's UDP payload size. And that is important because basically a client uses that to tell the server how big the maximum response size is that it is willing to accept from the server. And um, the issue with that is that uh, EDNS zero allows for UDP payloads of almost 64 kilobytes. Um, and for those of you who are less familiar with uh, internet transport protocols, a UDP is uh, um, a, a connectionless protocol. So you just fire datagrams across the internet and hope they arrive. Uh, and um, uh, a UDP packet may be, may be fragmented because it exceeds the, the maximum transmission size for, uh, for, for example, for ethernet. Um, and when it's fragmented, if one fragment doesn't arrive, then uh, you, don't, uh, uh, you don't receive a message at all. And you also don't know that a message didn't receive in its entirety because this never makes its way up to the application layer. So that makes it a rather uh, uh, unreliable transport mechanism in case fragmentation occurs. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so like I said, the problem with these large messages is, is that it can lead to IP fragmentation uh, if the message exceeds the MTU, the maximum transmission unit. Uh, and this was a huge problem in the early days of DNSSEC. Uh, so roughly pre-2014, lots of networks were having issues in uh, sending and receiving DNS responses that were DNSSEC signed because of fragmentation. 
Um, the, uh, one of the reasons why fragmentation actually occurs in practice in DNSSEC is that we, uh, uh, especially in the beginning, there was use of large RSA keys, which, which take up a lot of space in packets. Uh, and in, in many cases, multiple keys are used to sign uh, uh, DNS zones, which also means that you need to transport not just a single key, but you might need to transport as many as two or, uh, uh, sorry, three or four keys in a single response. And then you quickly exceed this MTU size. Now, fragmentation causes two problems, which we're gonna talk about in the next two slides. The first one is unreachability. Um, and one example of unreachability is caused by outdated firewall settings. So what you see here on the slide uh, from top to bottom is the case where a resolver, recursive caching name server under one sends a DNS query to an authoritative name server and it says that it is willing to accept responses of up to four kilobytes in size. So the authoritative name server sends back a response and that response somehow exceeds the maximum transmission unit. So it sends this response as two fragments. The firewall, be, which, is, which the recursive caching name server is behind, then blocks one of these fragments. Uh, and uh, the, that means that the recursive caching name server never receives a second fragment. And after a certain timeout, it will tell the authoritative name server, or rather the IP protocol stack on that recursive caching name server will tell the authoritative name server that it failed to uh, receive all of the fragments uh, and, and it ends there. Neither the application that was that sent this response nor the resolver that uh, is waiting for this response learns at the application layer that this happened. And basically the DNS response disappeared into thin air. Some timeout occurs in the DNS software and the DNS software tries again or tries some fallback mechanism. Um, research in 2012 uh, by actually one of my students and by uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Weaver from the US shows that up to 10% of resolvers on the internet struggle with fragmented UDP packets. And that is way, way, way too much. Um, for that reason, all mainstream DNS resolver implementations are actually implemented workarounds for this problem. Um, so if they don't receive a response from an authoritative name server within a certain amount of time, they will actually retry with different eDNS parameters uh, to prevent fragmentation. Um, and actually, as a consequence of this research, the uh, eDNS zero specification was changed and uh, people were told maybe you shouldn't be asking for responses that exceed the MTU by default because before that change, the default setting was to ask for responses up to four kilobytes in size. Okay. Um, the other problem is uh, Hertzberg fragment cache poisoning. Uh, and basically this is an attack that was introduced in 2013 uh, and it leverages fragmentation for cache poisoning. Um, and I won't explain it in detail, but the intuition is the following. The first fragment of a DNS packet um, uh, somehow identifies the, the, the DNS response because it contains the query ID and it contains the, um, the, the destination port on the client where the response is sent to. Uh, and these two uh, combined uh, actually do introduce some entropy into uh, um, DNS exchanges, uh, 32 bits to be precise. So if you want to perform a Kaminsky style cache poisoning attack, you basically need to guess the source port and the, the query ID. But in this attack, you don't have to guess those anymore because what you do is you don't poison the first fragment, which is actually identifiable, but you poison the second fragment, which contains no identification whatsoever. Um, and let me see if this works. Yes. So you put the records that you want to poison in second or later fragments, and those will just get accepted by the DNS resolver. And the irony of this is that DNSSEC's large responses help facilitate this attack. Of course, it only works against non-DNSSEC validating resolvers, right? Because if you poison something in a signed response, the signature validation will fail and you won't accept that response. However, if you run a DNS resolver and it does not do DNSSEC validation, then uh, uh, these responses will just be accepted. Um, so that is an issue. As a consequence, the DNS community really wants to avoid fragmentation because this is a huge issue. And for that, we use three strategies. The first strategy is to strip 
optional records from responses. This may have some consequences for performance. I'll show you a little bit more detail in the next slide. The second option is to use different cryptographic algorithms, for example, elliptic curve cryptography, because then you have smaller keys and smaller signatures, uh, which means that you're less likely to exceed this maximum message size. And finally, the DNS vendors have actually collaborated on sensible eDNS zero parameters that avoid fragmentation. And this was DNS flag day, and I will discuss that uh, later on. So let's look at stripping optional records. In the um, uh, dark area in the, uh, in the middle of the slide, you see that a DNS message can, consists of a header, a question section, answer, authority, and additional section. In many DNS packets, the authority and additional section are actually optional. So they are included as a convenience for DNS resolvers, um, but they are not a necessity in most messages in the protocol. In some messages, they're crucial, but in most messages, they are optional. Um, and because they are optional, stripping them reduces fragmentation significantly because it removes extra records, but it also removes any signatures over those extra records. So you can really reduce message sizes by, by turning on what is called minimal responses. And to show you what that does, I included a, a graph. This is from um, an authoritative name server that I used to be responsible for. Uh, and I hope you can clearly see the point where we turned uh, minimal responses on in week two of 2013, where you can see the average message size dropping from around uh, um, 900 bytes to roughly 180 bytes. That was a huge drop. But there, I want to stress there is a performance impact and it's actually not well understood because some of the uh, the information that is passed in, in additional and authority sections is used by DNS resolvers. Uh, and they now have to fetch this information separately, or they might make different decisions on which name server to contact for domains, for example. Okay. The second thing that we did was to advocate switching to uh, elliptic curve crypto. The original DNSX specifications assumed the use of RSA and only RSA. Uh, and ECC wasn't actually standardized for DNSX until 2012. Uh, and what you see on the slide here is the impact of switching to signing with uh, uh, elliptic curve crypto. The dark line towards the right of the plot is uh, um, uh, the CDF, or actually the top part of a CDF, of DNS uh, responses for domains that are signed with RSA. Uh, and this is uh, based on actual traffic recorded on a DNS uh, resolver. Uh, and what we also plotted in this graph are what happens if we change the signing algorithm uh, from uh, uh, the original signing algorithm RSA to uh, an elliptic curve variant. And the takeaway from this plot is that uh, all of the elliptic curve variants uh, actually result in 100% of the DNS responses that this particular resolver saw being smaller than the MTU for IPv6, which is 1280 bytes. Um, oh, when we talk about DNS flag day, I'll get back to why that, I, that particular MTU is relevant. Uh, and they're also smaller than the Ethernet MTU 1500 bytes, which is the sort of the default MTU on the internet. Um, interestingly, uh, if you were to use um, uh, ECDSA for signing and you turn on minimal responses, the NSSEC pack uh, uh, responses might actually fit within the original DNS datagram size of 512 bytes again. So it's really attractive to use elliptic curve algorithms for DNSSEC. The problem with ECC is that validation speed might be an issue because ECC signature verification is much slower than RSA. And um, verification is something we do a lot more than signing in the NSA. So this is something that as a community, we care about. So we wanted to know what is the impact on operations? And I include a little table that, uh, that, that comes from a paper about this uh, that, sh that shows you a comparison and I know this is an, 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 an apples to oranges, oranges comparison because I'm comparing RSA 2048 to uh, ECDSA uh, P256 and ECDSA P256 is of course cryptographically stronger than RSA 2048. Um, but this is based on how this is operationally 
deployed. So we would be using RSA 2048 for signing if we were to use RSA. Um, and if we were to switch to ECDSA, we would be using P256. So I'm comparing these two. So what you can see is that uh, in most cases, validation is an order of magnitude slower than the algorithm that is going to be replaced. Um, so we wanted to know if this was really going to have an operational impact. Um, and we modeled the impact of signature verification on DNSSEC operations. And our conclusion was that ECC use is actually feasible. Uh, and this rather nice plot that one of my students made, so I'm not going to claim credit for this really nice plot, shows you um, the impact. So the gray plane that you see in this plot is the ceiling of the maximum number of signature validations that we can do per second on a single core with ECDSA P384. Um, and what I also show the red uh, curved surface that intersects this plane uh, is the number of signature validations that I would need to do for a specific DNS query rate on the X axis um, versus a DNS deployment rate across the internet varying from no DNSSEC at all, so 0% to full DNSSEC deployment in all, the, all domains, 100%. And the takeaway from this plot is that on a rather busy resolver, the maximum numbers of uh, 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 queries that I would need to be able to process and the signature validation rate, even at 100% DNS, uh, uh, DNSSEC deployment would still be feasible, even if I were to use P384, which is by far not the most efficient elliptic curve algorithm. So that's good news. If we look at uh, uh, slightly uh, more um, uh, performant uh, algorithms, then you can see that, for example, if we were to use uh, uh, ECDSA P256 in a, an optimal implementation, which is the one that is an open SSL, I, I believe it was actually contributed by, uh, by Cloudflare, um, that can uh, achieve speeds of, uh, um, I think, today even more than, uh, than for this plot, but roughly 10,000 signature validations per second on a single core. So that's more than enough to deal with 100% uh, DNSSEC deployment on a very busy DNS resolver. Good. So that was about using elliptic curve crypto. What is this thing called DNS flag day? Due to the operational problems with fragmentation, DNS vendors decided actually to work together. So even in the year 2020, fragmentation was still an issue. Uh, and because of that, they had what was called DNS Flag Day. And in this, all major open source vendors and several uh, DNS operators changed eDNS zero settings in software and on app operational resolvers. And they limit the size for UDP transport to 1,232 bytes. And 1,232 bytes is the uh, given some headers that might be in packets, is the maximum size that you can fit within a single IPv6 packet uh, on the lowest IPv6 MP MTU. And why we, do we have to account for that very low MTU? That is because this thing that was causing us problems for delivery of fragments uh, uh, for uh, uh, DNSSEC is actually also a problem for IPv6, because if you block for example, ICMP messages uh, on firewalls, path MTU discovery in IPv6 will suffer. And IPv6 will then automatically default to the lowest MTU that it supports, which is 1280 bytes. So that is the baseline from which we have to work. Anything above that is fallback to TCP. Uh, and this is also something that we want to avoid if possible, because it puts higher requirements on the systems that we are running. Okay. Why did I tell you all of this? Because this is a lot of information about DNSSEC and the way it works now, why is that relevant? So DNSSEC increases the size of DNS messages and that causes availability and security problems. And the community has worked very, very, very hard to mitigate these issues. Um, and this has shaped the mindset of the community. And that is why this is important if we're talking about post-quantum uh, crypto in the context of DNSSEC. Um, a switch to quantum safe algorithms has to take this mindset into account. The DNS community is going to uh, 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 debug 
if we tell them, well, you just have to accept that we have some very large signatures that we put in packets and you may have some fragmentation, but hmm, that works on the internet, right? No, it doesn't. Okay, so what does this mean for post-quantum crypto in DNSSEC? So I hope I've convinced you that signature size, public key size and verification speed are an issue that the community actually takes very seriously. And if those issues aren't addressed, uh, adoption of these algorithms is going to be an issue in the community. Um, we do realize that dealing with larger signatures or larger keys may be unavoidable, um, but higher computational load for verification should really be avoided because that is going to cause um, real operational problems. Um, we also want to balance out any changes in favor of a lower workload for DNS resolvers. The workhorses of the DNS are the DNS resolvers. The authoritative name servers can deal with a little bit of extra work. They typically uh, serve far fewer queries per second than a typical DNS resolver. So I'm going to talk about some green, orange, and red lines uh, that we have for uh, uh, post-quantum algorithms in general for use in DNSSEC. The first one I want to talk about is signature size. Ideal signature sizes are smaller than RSA 2048-bit signature, so that's less than 256 bytes for a signature. Uh, why is that? Well, we know that today's internet still uses a lot of RSA 2048 in DNSSEC, and that is absolutely fine, provided you use minimal responses and that you don't use an absurd number of keys in your zone. Um, smaller than or equal to RSA 4096 is probably something we can still deal with, provided there aren't too many signatures in a single DNS packet. Anything larger than that is a no-go. Uh, because it will just cause so many problems for a DNS transport uh, that we seriously have to rethink the whole protocol. Public key size, again, uh, similar story. Um, for keys that are, um, so anything between 4096 and maybe one megabyte, and this is, I put an asterisk there because I just pulled that number out of the air, right? Um, Anything larger causes uh, problems, but we might be willing to deal with that uh, under certain conditions, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Signing speed. Again, uh, ideally, um, it's, uh, it's somewhere near uh, RSA 2048. Um, a little bit slower might be acceptable. Um, more than 50 milliseconds per signature uh, is probably not okay. Um, because of the sheer number of signatures that you need to create, for example, to sign something like a top-level domain. So let's take a modest size top-level domain like .nl. You would have to create in the order of 14 million signatures to sign that entire zone. Um, if you uh, uh, have signing speeds of more than 50 milliseconds per signature, that's going to be an issue because a new .nl zone is published once every 30 minutes, and we can't make that deadline if we exceed this signing speed. Um, validation speed, um, ideally uh, around about the performance of ECDSA P256. Um, P384 is probably still also acceptable, uh, so an equivalent speed. Um, anything slower than ECDSA P384, if you think back to that um, graph I showed you, that's going to be an issue because as soon as DNSSEC deployment grows, we are going to get into a situation where we, uh, uh, where a resolver won't be able to validate signatures on time to deliver responses. Now, maybe a few other uh, uh, restrictions. Um, we might be willing to accept uh, uh, stateful signing. Of course, if you have multi-signer multi setups, that might be a little bit tricky, but there are algorithms that have stateful uh, signing, for example, uh, XMSS. Uh, what is a no-go is that you need special hardware in order to be able to sign um, because uh, DNSSEC in general is does not rely on the use of HSMs. Um, we only see those in, uh, for example, top-level domain operations, but a typical uh, uh, organization that signs their zones will just do this with software. Okay, so 
I want to talk a little bit about a study that uh, one of my PhD uh, uh, candidates did. Actually, he uh, graduated last Friday, so I shall now call him Dr. Moritz. Uh, a study that uh, 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 he did where we looked at the uh, round three entries uh, for the NIST competition. And basically, we in, had the following four priorities. We wanted the signature size to be uh, smaller than 1232 bytes. So that's actually a rather conservative uh, approach he, that we're willing to accept that. Um, validation speed, more than 1,000 signatures per second. So that's a little bit slower than uh, we can do for uh, P384. Uh, key size, ideally less than 64 kilobytes. So we can put it in a single DNS message, even if we need to transmit it over TCP. But we might conditionally accept larger keys if that means some of the other priorities are met. Uh, and signing speed more than 100 signatures per second. So that's uh, 10 milliseconds per signature. Um, and basically, if you then look at the round three algorithms, there are three uh, algorithms that are suitable. The only one that could potentially be a drop-in replacement is Falcon. Um, but as you can see, I hope you can read this, but as you can see, the public key for that and the signature size for that are rather unattractive. Um, because we will, even, in, even if we have a single signature, we just stay within the MTU, right? But if we have two signatures, we already exceed the MTU, which means either the message gets fragmented or we have to retry the, the DNS request over TCP. Um, Rainbow and red gems are very attractive from the perspective of signature size, um, which is why we might actually be willing to uh, consider these. Uh, but they have very large public key sizes. And the concrete problem with that is that you cannot transport these keys in any DNS message because 64 kilobytes is the maximum limit for a DNS message. So this requires a change to the protocol. We need to accommodate transport of these larger keys either out of band or some sort of chaining mechanism where we transmitted in multiple DNS messages. And this is something we currently have a student working on. Takeaways from these round three entries is that thinking back to our green, orange, and red lines, there is not a single NIST round three entrant that is ideal for DNSSEC. Uh, and if we consider signature size as the highest priority, the two most suitable candidates, like I said, are rainbow and red gems. Uh, and a challenge for both of these is the public key size. Um, Oh, and by the way, we only considered level one security here, right? 128 bits. So if we want to go to higher security levels in the, 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 the NIST competition, uh, we, uh, we may find no suitable candidates whatsoever. Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to skate on thin ice here because now I'm gonna say, well, what about the Sochinis? This workshop is about the Sochinis. Uh, and I'm going to repeat the statement that I made at the beginning in that I'm not a cryptographer, nor am I a mathematician. Um, but maybe I want to make some observations on navigating the literature, right? Because in preparation for this talk, of course, I had a look at some of the, uh, the proposed signature schemes and I tried to make sense of, of the literature. And what I found there is that there are no, there doesn't seem to be a uniform way to talk about public key and signature sizes. And this is an issue, right? Because for me, somebody who does research on DNS and DNSSEC, I want to be able to do an oranges to oranges comparison. And this also go, goes for single core performance metrics. Because if I want to say something about the applicability of a certain signature scheme in DNSSEC, I need to be able to compare different uh, uh, proposals to each other. And sometimes some papers will talk about wall clock time uh, for uh, uh, performance metrics, or and some talk about CPU cycles. And CPU cycles are actually really rather hard to convert to um, uh, what this means for a real world use case. I would actually advocate that ben benchmarks on representative systems with wall clock time are probably more useful for practical applications. It also all feels very new. I was digging back and the, the earliest paper that I found find goes back to like 2018. Um, so this, for me as a non-expert raises the question, has this been crypto analyzed to death and is this re ready for the big screen? I don't know the answer to that. You are way more qualified than I am. Um, so then I looked at all of these options and I asked myself where are we headed? It's so, I looked at one particular one, so I'm, I stumbled around in the dark a little bit. 
and I looked at one scheme with DNSSEC glasses on, just to have an idea of does this make sense to use this in DNSSEC. And I looked at ski sign because it looked rather attractive. The key and the signature size at NIST level one look really good. I mean, a signature size of 204 bytes, a public key size of 64 bytes, that makes me happy because this is something we can immediately apply to DNSSEC. Uh, and then I find that signing speed is somewhat an, of an issue. And I'll explain the asterisk later on, right? Signing speed quoted in the latest paper I could find was 2.3 seconds per signature on a sing single core. That is too slow. Um, I, I will never be able to sign a size, uh, a, a reasonably sized um, DNS zone with that. Um, validation currently also quoted in that paper is 40 times slower than ECDSA P384, uh, which is also too slow, right? So we're talking 42 uh, milliseconds per, uh, per signature on a single CPU core. One little caveat here is that this may actually work for the DNS route. Because of caching in DNS, we don't have to do signature validations very often. Also, the root doesn't see a lot of re-signing. So even if it takes 2.3 signatures, uh, 2.3 seconds, seconds per signature, this is actually probably okay for the root of the DNS. But an algorithm that we can only use for the root uh, is not very helpful because we want to be able to use uh, this algorithm at all levels of the DNS where we have way more signatures that we need to create and validate. What I don't know, of course, is um, how much this can improve. Because I also saw in the literature that compared to early ideas of, uh, uh, for signature schemes based on the uh, isogenies, the performance has increased dramatically. So if such a performance improvement is still foreseeable in the future, then uh, this might actually be very attractive provided that such an improve speed improvement doesn't then mean we have a signature size that is uh, uh, five times as large as we have now uh, for this example. And the same goes for the public key. Um, so that's my question. Will this improve? That's the question I want to leave you with. Um, I quickly want to touch on some ongoing work that we have uh, that we are doing right now. So we are prototyping NIST candidates in DNSSEC, and uh, I saw that Douglas and Jason are both here. So they're they're working on. Uh, uh, they did an implementation in Bind of Falcon, if I recall correctly. Uh, but we also have a master student uh, at my university who is who's working on this. So we are giving him some real world data and tell him, okay, what if you put these NIST candidates in there? What is that going to mean in practice? Um, I have a student who is looking at rethinking the NSX signing. So that's actually an idea that uh, Bus uh, uh, had where we use hash based signatures and Merkle trees. It's a really a rather nice project where we go, well, what if we have to do the NSX from scratch today? Could we do it differently and could we use uh, different signature schemes? Uh, I'm also working on drafting an RFC for hash-based signatures in DNSSEC. So, uh, so this is an effort that is uh, being led by Verisign, the operator for .com and .net, um, as a safe fallback under all conditions. This is a collaborative effort. Um, and finally, uh, there is also likely going to be an, an RFC on, or at least a draft of an RFC on alternative transports for DNSSEC in a post-quantum world. So. What if we really can't, can't cram this stuff into UDP anymore? What are we going to do? Um, with that, I uh, finish my presentation, open the floor for, for questions and discussion. I hope this was useful. Uh, Sophia, back to you. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, I don't know if people have any kind of questions that they want to post right now. You can either, oh, Okay, you can write it. I guess people can have the raise their hands reactions. I can try searching you. Um, but that was a really amazing presentation. So, my uh, question... by the way, there are, there are some references on the last slide, and I saw that Sophia posted the slide. Let me stop sharing because then I can actually see the chat again. Yeah, actually, I put a lot of resources on the website specifically for people who want to learn about DNSSEC because sometimes it's difficult to find how DNSSEC works. So I try to find the best resources out there, how to understand DNSSEC. Um, so actually, um, what do you think will be the most important, the most easy path for DNSSEC that you think after seeing like um, 
state-based signature, hash, hash-based signatures uh, compared to the estrogenists, compared to the other candidates and other estrogenists, which of the three do you think is going to be the easiest one to go? <laughs> yeah, that's the million dollar question because all of the options that are currently on the table actually have one disadvantage or another, right? So we have to choose. Um, depending on the outcome of the uh, of the NIST competition, um, I would say that likely um, uh, Rainbow or Gems, whichever one makes it, is the most likely candidate to make it for, for DNSSEC because of the signature size. Um, keys are actually not transported that frequently in DNSSEC. Because, because of caching, right? So a DNS resolver caches not only records, so it caches the key records, but it also caches validation state. And that means it doesn't have to fetch, fetch keys very often. Um, so if we have to resort to a different transport mechanism just to fetch keys, that might be acceptable. The problem is it requires a protocol change, um, right? Because the current protocol has no way of transporting anything over 64 kilobytes in size. Uh, and such a protocol change takes time within the ITF. Uh, that's going to take uh, at least a year, if not two, to get anything standardized there. And then it needs to be implemented. And then the new implementations have to be deployed on the internet, right? This, this is slow. Actually, um, uh, we wrote a paper about uh, algorithm agility in, um, in DNSSEC uh, last year, where we looked at how flexible is DNSSEC at adopting new algorithms? And, and we took um, ECDSA and EDDSA as case studies in that. And it takes years from uh, the first moment that they are considered for standardization until it is so widely deployed that you can actually switch to signing with this algorithm and people will be able to validate your signatures. There, this was in the order of five to 10 years. So even if we change to these new algorithms, it's going to take that much time, which is why it's important that we make a decision sooner rather than later about which path, which road we're going to go down. And then we need to start making the protocol changes. I see buses raise his hand. Yeah, you go Does back. that answer your question? Does yes. that answer your question, Sophia? <laughs> okay, yeah. good. You go, Bas. Yeah, um, you said that, um, uh, because you don't need to download the fetch the public keys very often that that is that can be cached um but uh this happened that is this is great for websites which you find often but also when you visit a website for the first time which your resolver hasn't cached it has to fetch it and if it's not a great internet connection that adds delay uh and if if the uh the keys are uh Public keys are a megabyte, okay, uh, 200 kilobytes. Then how many can you can you can you store on on, on the little the, the thing that does the resolving? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're if it's your ISP's resolver, you're probably fine. If it's the Raspberry Pi that sits in your utility cabinet, it might be a little bit more of a challenge. But um, so I actually I have looked at this in the past. Like, how much information do we cache on a DNSSEC validating resolver? How many keys do we cache? How many signatures do we cache? And actually, this is surprisingly modest. Um, the thing with the internet is that anything on the internet is a zip distribution, right? So it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a popularity distribution where the most popular domains are, are requested by far the most. Um, and that, that means that the, 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 the maximum number of keys that you need to store in a cache is actually rather modest. Um, so that's the, the, the good news. Um, the bad news, of course, is that yes, transporting anything that, that is over a certain size is going to take time. Uh, and this is going to impact your um, uh, time to first byte if you're accessing a website for the first time. Um, generally speaking, if you look at uh, the impact of DNS res resolution on web browsing, to take a to take a concrete use case, then it's in the order of ten percent of the time 
in a web or spent on a web page fetch is waiting for um, uh, DNS responses. And that, that's a, from a study from about five years ago. So maybe that situation has improved a little bit. Um, but then uh, web pages have, uh, are becoming ever more complex, which means you have to more, do more DNS queries. So this will probably keep pace somehow. Um, if you add some time to that, it's going to impact your your rendering time, but it's probably not going to be that dramatic unless you are on a really poor connection. And since we're not doing validation on endpoints, right? This change, this picture, of course, completely changes as soon as you start doing validation on endpoints. So let's say I have my mobile phone here. If I'm going to do validation on this, uh, I have a challenge because I have to transport all that key material over the cellular, uh, cellular network, uh, which in the Netherlands is rather reliable. But as soon as I cross the border into Germany, I'm back on edge. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's never going to work. So uh, yeah, which is another reason why endpoint validation is probably not going to become the norm uh, uh, if, we, uh, if we switch to these kinds of algorithms. Does that answer your question, Bas? I see a question in the chat and I'm going to repeat it for the audience. So Andrea, you can also unmute yourself if you want to ask it yourself. I mean, I don't mind. I or if you don't want to speak. But there's a little bit of noise in the background. Ah, there's noise in the background. Okay, okay sorry, <laughs> no worries. I, I, was, I just read the question and I thought, oh, there's another question underneath. Sorry, Andrea. Do hardware accelerated performance results matter either on dedicated hardware or once common processors add support for PQC protocols or are the signature, signatures computed and validated purely in software? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. So um, if you, I, I will break that down into two categories. So um, there are DNS, no, I'm actually gonna break it down into three pieces. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about signing first. So on the signing side, there are operators that use HSMs. Um, so if some sort of acceleration for PQC algorithms becomes available in HSMs, they will leverage this. However, the vast majority of signers will do so purely in software, in which case they might only benefit if mainstream CPUs um, add extra instructions to accelerate parts of PQC algorithms. Whether or not that is uh, feasible, I'm not enough of an expert to answer that question. There are people that know much better than I do uh, whether that's possible or not. Um, if I think, for example, about Falcon, I seem to remember that that requires, for example, floating point computations to do, uh, um, to create signatures. So that might be challenging. Um, on the verif verifier side, um, a resolver is already, so, okay. If you are an ISP, a resolver is a cost center because it's something you need to operate for your users to be able to access the internet. The problem is if that cost center is down, your users can no longer access their internet and they're going to call your help desk. So this is a fine line that, that ISPs are walking. They want to deploy enough resolvers, but then they don't want, they don't want to have an endless uh, data center full of resolvers to deal with DNS queries, right? They, that it's it's something that has to work, but that they, they don't really care about. Um, so if they have to invest in special purpose hardware in order to do to speed up verification, that's not a road they're likely to go down because um, this is a cutthroat market. If they have to spend extra money to get dedicated hardware for that, that's not going to work. Again, if there are additional uh, uh, um, if there are extensions to existing CPU architectures that speed up computation, that might be attractive. Or it might be attractive for them to say, well, if Intel or ARM or whoever adds instructions that makes this, that, that speeds up these algorithms, that might be both a reason to choose those algorithms for signing and a reason for um, operators to deploy those uh, com uh, computer architectures. I hope that answers your question. Uh, maybe you can type this in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, William has asked another question. Uh, is it feasible to do some sort of pre-computation for specific public keys since they change so rarely? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so let me see if I understand this correctly. 
I think you're asking, can I do a lot of signing in advance if the key doesn't change very often, right? So if I, let, let's say I want to use key sign, which has this horribly slow signature uh, creation uh, from the perspective of DNSSEC, uh, keep researching folks, uh, but it is slow for DNSSEC, right? Let's say I wanted to use that and I want to start, I want to have my system generate signatures constantly so that I have like this reservoir of signatures that I can use. Apart from the security perspective where I might not want to have lots of signatures lying around that are valid in, 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 in to eternity, um, it might actually work for certain DNS zones. Again, for the root, which doesn't change very often, this is actually entirely feasible. What you have to think of is that the root of the DNS, the only thing that changes in there on a, uh, on a regular basis are the signatures because signatures have a limited lifetime and they need to be renewed every once in a while. But changes to the root, so for example, a new DS record for a new signing key for a top level domain, or a change in uh, name servers for a top level domain, that is actually rare. There are um, very few of these events. For this algorithm agility paper, we actually looked at key rollovers for top level domains in the root zone. And those were pretty rare. I mean, there are there a handful a year. Um, if there's a change to a DNS zone, you need new signatures, right? Because the record set changes. Um, so yeah, that might be feasible. Uh, but again, probably only for the root, or if you are, let's say you are um, a hosting provider and you operate lots of small DNS zones. Let's say you are um, uh, GoDaddy. Uh, who has uh, the, the biggest uh, uh, domain name registrar in the world, right? They have 50 million odd domain names or something that they manage in their portfolio. But most of those are mom and pop stores, right? They're the corner store that sells you fruit. Uh, and that corner store that still sells you fruit has a very simple DNS zone. It has an MX record that points the, the mail servers to GoDaddy, and it has an A record that points the IP address to go to these web servers, which run the website for, for this uh, mom and pop store. That zone never changes, right? So there you can pre-generate signatures. Does that answer your question, William? And just leave a comment on the chat. Uh, Boss says for DNSSEC batch signing is interesting. Yes, it is. If you can create multiple signatures at the same time, that is indeed great because if you can use that to speed up, that will be helpful if you can do some sort of parallelization. Yes. Still, you would need to do a lot of parallelization to, to get away from 2.3 signatures. William says, I was thinking more about verification, some sort of pre-computed data in your cache, since I wonder how else well your problem is. Optimizing for verification of a few public keys. Ha, huh. that's a nice question, right? Because this is actually something that Bas and I have been discussing for, for this hash-based scheme, where basically what the, like the, the high level idea of that is that rather than signing each and every individual record in the zone, you use Merkle authentication trees for the individual records in the zone, and then you only sign the top of that Merkle tree. And this allows you to do two very nice things. First of all, it reduces the number of signature validations that you have to do, because once you validate that root element, computing the uh, authentication path for the Merkle tree is actually rather cheap um, and fast. Um, and the other thing that you can do there is that you can group records, popular records that are requested a lot. If you group them in a single Merkle tree, then you get even more of a reduction in validation requirements because in order to validate the, the sort of the authentication paths, you only need to do one signature verification for the top of that Merkle tree. So yes, this is something that we have thought about. Um, whether or not um, some pre-computation can happen. I'm, I'm not enough of an expert on crypto algorithms to, to say whether you could apply this in, in different settings. What you do have to realize is that sig validation state is cached. So once I've validated a signature once, then for the lifetime of that record, that validation suffices. I, uh, the resolver is not gonna validate again until that record expires in the cache. And 
there are implementations that will actually check if the signature has changed. So what they will do is when they refetch the record, right, the, 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 the record expires in the cache, they fetch it again. They just do a bitewise comparison of the two signatures. If they're the same, the signature hasn't changed, hasn't changed, so you don't have to validate it again. So there are optimizations already in the software that do this. Does that answer your question, William? Yes, okay. Uh, maybe the last question. Um, so one of the two ways that I see that we can go in the network protocols and integrate post quantum cryptography in them is just, the first one is to do the one-on-one -on -one mapping, which is just, you have signatures, classical ones, and then just replace them somehow <laughs> for post quantum signatures. The second path is rather changing the protocol itself. And for example, in the case of TLS, achieving other ways um, to get to authentication that do not rely on signature because the post quantum contact part is really difficult. The second part, while seems more painful because it requires sitting down with the working groups and convincing them that you're going to have to be changing the protocol and all, at least for me from a TLS perspective, because I've been thinking more from a TLS perspective, um, it also allows a certain other properties to be part now of the protocol. So for example, the change that we're doing from TLS to post-quantum might also mean that we can also now make TLS, the whole handshake encrypted by default in a new version of the protocol. Because if we're making the change to post-quantum, we can shove also other properties <laughs> down the line. Um, a question that of course people had, and this is the controversial topic on the NSX, is if we can make it confidential, <laughs> which is the property that some people will want. Do you think at some point we will change the version of DNSSEC in a post-quantum way with this new, with other security ideas in mind? And what will they be? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. This is actually something, um, the, the community is slowly starting this debate, right? Because they're, they're slowly starting to realize that uh, we're kind of stuck and there might not be an easy way forward where we drop in a different algorithm and we're done. Um, and then of course, this raises the question, how could we do this differently? Um, one of the, um, the discussions that then comes up and, and, and then I know that this is a problematic discussion is well, why don't we transport everything over TLS? And then, uh, quickly, somebody says, yes, but that doesn't give you authenticity and integrity, right? It just means that the, nobody can mess with the, the, the content in transit, but still you have no guarantee of authenticity of the, uh, of the records. But let, let's assume that that's the case. Then we still have the issue that we then have to have post-quantum TLS for every... Uh, um, uh, every form of DNS transport. Um, and as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, setting up a TLS connection with post-quantum uh, algorithms is still um, requires quite a lot of round trips, a lot of packets and a lot of computation. Uh, now add that to a protocol where every, every nanosecond counts, DNS. It's, it's, it's so fast that you don't notice it's there. Once we do that, you will notice it's there. Uh, and uh, maybe that's the only viable option, right? Maybe this is the only path we can go down. Um, but this is, and it's it's hard because you have, once you have these discussions, you have to think about, you have to have all of these moving parts in your head, right? You have to think about, okay, but it's, it, yeah, let's, let's all just, just do TLS. Oh, hold on. When we do TLS, we need to do this, or let's all do quick but then you still have to do crypto there. So you're just, it's, it's basically like this, in Dutch, we call this the waterbed effect, right? If you push here, something comes up on the other side. Um, and this is, um, I think that's, that's a challenge. Um, somehow this, this, uh, um, this idea that uh, that Bas came up with and that we've been debating about the, the, um, using the, the Merkle trees, that seems less le more likely to be attractive than using different transports. 
even though uh, that requires a ma major protocol change. The thing that, I, that I'm worried about is that we're going to end up in a situation where we keep debating this, but we don't progress. Um, and right now, this is fine, right? Because everybody knows that a, a, a viable quantum computer that can break um, uh, asymmetric algorithms is still at least a decade, if not more, ahead of us. Um, and then suddenly it happens, and we need to spend another five to 10 years to transition to new algorithms because this is just how long it takes because people need to upgrade their software, et cetera. And some, some systems are never going to get there. Um, that's worrying, right? So we need to start the, this thinking process now, uh, but convincing an already busy IETF working group on, on DNS that they need to spend time on this is a little bit of an uphill battle. I don't have a better answer than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same in the majority of security protocols in the ITF. But, but just recently, the ITF has been starting to the realization that post quantum cryptography. Is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's stuff definitely stuff. landing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. no. This, this, uh, well, and I think uh, the, the NIST competition is, is a major driving force in that, right? Because rather than it being a discussion of if we are going to switch to post quantum crypto, it now becomes a discussion of when are we going to move to post-quantum crypto, right? Because as soon as NIST finishes this competition, um, at some point we will get sort of blessed algorithms that will end up in public tender documents for US government services, right? So some US government agency is going to procure IT services and in that procurement request is going to say, oh, and by the way, it needs to use these algorithms because they're NIST approved. That's going to be a driving force. Yeah. Uh, and this is also what I, when I talk about this to other people, this is what I tell them. I said, well, it, the game is over. Once this NIST competition started going and, and once there's an outcome, this is a, uh, 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 this is a moving train, right? So, so this is something that is going to happen. It's now a matter of when, not if. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that has sunk in with the IETF as well. Yes. Completely agree. I also don't want that what happens is what happened with TLS 1.2, that it got to a point that it was so attacked that then they had to move to TLS 1.3. So I hope that we don't have to arrive to a quantum computer actually attacking the protocol. <laughs> well, let's wait and see. So next, in, in two weeks time, I'm going to try to convince identity and access management people that they need to start thinking about post-quantum. So let's see. Okay, so I see no more questions, but you can always ask also more questions either in the silly chat later on if people want it. Um, I'll try to find an answer at the time we find who, who can answer at that time. Um, if people want to socialize, there's the wonder chat if people want to talk more. And with that, I guess, thank you very much, Ronald. It was a really amazing talk. And also for all of the questions that were asked. <laughs> You're welcome. It was, uh, it was fun to be here today.